This is a lesson on how to practice sight reading music on the classical guitar, but I hope that you'll find it useful for any instrument that you play. So in this lesson, what I'm going to do is for the beginners out there, I'll define what sight reading is. I'll cover some of the benefits of becoming a good sight reader. And then we'll actually get into the priorities, what your priorities should be when you're sight reading. So where should your mind space be at when you're actually doing the act of sight reading? And then I'll go over some tips for improving your sight reading. So a whole bunch of different ways to make your sight reading a little bit stronger. And then finally, I'll cover some uh, musical materials for sight reading. So some books and, and methods that I've come across. So what is sight reading music? Well, let's take a basic definition um, from Wikipedia and then talk about it on the guitar. So in music, sight reading, also called prima vista, Italian meaning at first sight, is the practice of reading and performing a piece of music notation that the performer has not seen or learned before. Sight singing is used to describe a singer who is sight reading. Both activities require the musician to play or sing the notated rhythms and pitches. So yeah, absolutely. And guitar players are generally, compared to a lot of other instruments, especially orchestral instruments, instrumentalists, uh, we're weak sight readers. And there's some reasons for that which we can talk about, but in general, it's just something that we should practice more actively on, in our daily practice sessions. So what are the benefits of sight reading uh, music or being a good sight reader? Well, for one thing, um, enjoyment of just playing lots of music with ease. You know, without having to practice, you can play music at a certain level um, quite easily and it'll sound very musical and, and you'll just be able to enjoy doing that, to pick up a book and just start reading a bunch of music. So that's very rewarding. Um, learning new repertoire will be much easier and much faster if you can read really well, right? Uh, it's kind of, you know, that that's mixed with like knowing how to read music well, but sight reading will allow you to, to do that. Um, rehearsals and duets and chamber music will be much easier, especially on those first rehearsals when you haven't practiced your part that much and you show up to the rehearsal and you have to just play the piece and everyone's playing in time and going along. Uh, it, being a good sight reader just makes that much more enjoyable. Sight reading and performance skills have a very similar priorities. So what you do on the, pre on the stage when you're performing for an audience is very similar to what you do when you're sight reading. Um, we'll talk about that in a second, but what, with what the priority should be. But, you know, keeping the beat and not going back and fixing mistakes, those kinds of things are really important in both. So those two skills can complement each other. It's great for researching new pieces. You know, when I research new pieces, I have to read through a lot of stuff. And being able to sight read just makes that really, you know, possible and practical. If you play casual gigs, like background music gigs, um, it's very, very helpful because if you have to play for two or three hours uh, at a gig, uh, you know, you don't want to have to maintain two, three hours of music. If, you can, if you're a good sight reader, you show up, you read through whatever you got, and... Um, it can be really, really easy way to uh, get some extra bucks and then just enjoy yourself too, right? Um, it brings music theory to life. Um, being a good sight reader, especially in multiple clefs, uh, can really help um, when you're doing music theory to pick up your instrument and hear what you're doing. Uh, it's just very helpful in that regard. It, it can bring things off the page and onto your instrument and guitar players aren't usually that great at doing that. Also, if you want to be an accompanist to a singer or another instrument, especially if you want to be a professional accompanist uh, and you have to like accompany someone's violin recital with all their students, you could have you know a couple hours of, of accompanimental material that you have to play. And you really don't want to practice that material. You kind of just want to show up and, and play it um, because it's just too impractical sometimes to, to practice all that stuff. So, And there's tons more reasons and benefits to being a good sight reader, but those are a few. So, priorities when sight reading music. There's a lot of priorities I could list, but I've, I've narrowed it down to just three priorities. First one is keeping the beat. So the number one priority is to play with a steady beat, 
to keep going and to know where you are in the music. You know, you can make errors, you can make mistakes, but if you lose the beat, then you're probably going to lose the, the listener or your place in the music. And you can just imagine if someone's listening to you and they're tapping their foot and then you, uh, you make an error with the beat and you kind of like go back and try to fix your mistake. It's like you're compounding the mistakes on top of each other. You're creating this big, this big um, black hole of mistakes that really suck up you and the listener uh, instead of just going to the next beat and it just being a little tiny thing that you missed and on you go. Everything is still steady. It sounds like music. Um, especially, you know, in when you're playing chamber music, people make mistakes, but you just keep going because everyone else keeps going, right? Um, actually, I can just demonstrate. So if I have a little piece of music... Now let me play that again, and I'm going to try to miss a few things, if I can. So I missed a few things, there was like, uh, obviously there were some things going wrong, but I just went on to the next beat, so I kind of kept the music going, as opposed to really making a big deal. You know, and like going back and trying to fix it, you're just compounding the errors that are happening. So number one priority, keep feeling the beat and keep going and keep moving forward. And, and minimize those mistakes and don't worry about them. And that's the next priority is don't worry about mistakes. I know it seems like the same thing as the previous one, but you, you, there's a couple of things connected to this. Uh, one thing, choose a tempo that you can play well at. Because, you know, we're, this is an art form. Like, we're not just trying to get the right number of notes all the time. We are trying to make it sound like good music, even though we're sight reading. So uh, you want to pick a tempo that's, you know, appropriate to the music. And you certainly don't want to go back and correct it like I was just doing. It kind of just produces extra errors and, and gaps. And you can't tap anymore and stuff like that. Um, you can think of the notes and the beats as a point system. But a point system that like you get, you only get new points if you get the next beat. You don't get points for going back and getting a, a note that you missed or a pitch that you missed. Instead, you only get points by getting what's coming next at all times. And we'll talk about this in a bit. Uh, the last priority would be to look ahead and prepare. So when you're sight reading, you want to look ahead of where you are playing so much that you know what's coming up. And this is particularly important on guitar because sometimes we have shifts up the, the fingerboard and because of our instrument scale length, uh, those shifts can be significant and we want to be able to prepare for those shifts or key changes or whatever it might be. So you always want to be looking ahead of where you are. Um, I have a little game I play with my students and I'll talk about that when I'm in the tip section. Okay, tips for learning to sight read or improve your sight reading whole bunch of different tips here. I'll try to be quick. Um, practice sight reading every day. Yeah, of course. Um, that makes total sense, but we often do forget to do it. So when I say practice sight reading every day, I don't mean like go over music you've seen before or something like that. I would recommend that you, you both practice pieces you haven't seen before, but also maybe like method books and things like that. Um, and I'll talk about this in a second, but um, practice things that will that will help you become a better sight reader. So practicing um, from books that have pieces in different keys is really useful. Or practicing from books that have melodic, um, single line melodic exercises, and then also like harmonic exercises with chords. Uh, variety is, is becoming comfortable in a variety of textures is just so important. So do it every day, just for a small amount at the beginning of your practice session. It can just be 5% of your practice session, but, but do it every time and you, you will get better. The next tip is to force yourself to look ahead of where you are in the music. 
So um, one of the games I play with my students when I practice sight reading is I'll have them remember the first bar of music in an, a sight reading exercise or something like that. So they have to memorize the first bar. And then what I do is I cover up the first bar with a piece of paper. As they're playing the first bar, as they get near the end of the bar, I cover up the next bar that they're going to play. And then when they're getting near the end of that bar, I cover up the next bar. So what it means is that if they don't look ahead and, and grab the whole next bar of material, then they won't be able to continue playing. So it's like a, it's a very intense concentration game where I keep covering up. And with more advanced students, maybe I'll cover up two measures of music. And they have to look ahead and grab, in their sight, they have to grab two measures of music at a time before I cover it up. That's just, that game emphasizes how much you need to force yourself to look ahead. And it's actually a skill. Like, when I am sight reading, I look way ahead of the music much more than I do when I'm playing a piece that I kind of know. Or I've practiced a little bit. So you have to really, truly force yourself. And, and everyone can do this because if you think you don't have to because you look ahead enough, well, just look further. I mean, just keep looking further ahead and at some point that will become challenging and it might seem weird for some musicians um, especially students to think about the fact that their fingers are going to be moving and doing something and their minds are going to be looking at something new and something something so far ahead that it's not what they're doing over here and that's one of the skills of sight reading so you have to force yourself to look ahead okay next tip consider using method and sight reading books so method books are really great because they usually like have a variety of textures or they're focused on like some kind of pedagogical aspect. And that pedagogical aspect is probably good for your reading skills overall. Um, it might be making a connection between um, scale fingerings and, what, and playing an example in that position of the guitar. You know, if you're playing in the fifth position and the example is in A major, then knowing an A major scale, you know, will allow you to know kind of what fingerings you're going to use in that position. So there's a connection between knowing the scale fingering there and, and reading the music. A uh, very strong connection. You, you know the fingering pattern before you even begin playing. So it really, really helps. Um, I'll point out some some methods when, and some materials when we get there, but that's the kind of idea. And you know, sight reading books are really great because they usually have a, such a variety of textures, and it's like learning a couple hundred pieces, but they're all in tiny little exercises. So it can kind of uh, really make you comfortable with a great amount of variety without you having to play like a thousand pieces, right? So next thing, uh, focus on rhythm and use a metronome. Uh, the metronome is really great because if I demonstrate that example again, when I miss a note, the metronome just keeps beeping, right? It's good practice for me to, if I miss a note, to just keep going. Or if I play a wrong note. <laughs> Even if I play like a ton of wrong notes, it's good that I arrive at that, that, that fourth bar right when I'm supposed to and just keep going. It's really good practice. So using a metronome and, and really focusing on, on rhythm as your, one of your priorities. Um, another good tip is prepare before you begin at a glance. So when you have your the sight, sight reading example in front of you, just quickly look at the time signature, look at the key signature, look at the title, look at the composer, and just quickly scan the music at a total glance to see if there's any um, crazy upper position playing, big chords, um, some weird marking, or some strange rhythm. You know, just by a quick glance, you can just see like, okay, that's going to be coming up. So when I when I'm nearing that point, I better be ready for that. Also, just always having the, the time signature and the key signature clearly in your mind. Um, sometimes when I'm sight reading, I have to like look back at the key, <laughs> at the key to make sure that I'm not like freaking out in my own head. Uh, but if you just make a habit 
of checking those things before you begin that can be really useful. Next tip, um, choose a tempo that allows you to play musically. Let's remember that we're trying to play music and we're trying to, it's, I know it's sight reading, but it's still an art and it, we're still playing music and we're trying to make good music. So always pick a slower tempo than you think so that you have a little bit of breathing room if something funny comes up in the music. Next tip is um, practice sight reading chamber music with friends. It's a really fun thing to do. And you know, the, mu the music itself might be kind of easy in some ways, but the experience of playing in a group and sight reading can be very challenging because everyone else is gonna just keep going. And you know, if you make mistakes or lose your place, it, it could make, it could infect the group with mistakes. So you really, um, it's really good forced practice. Even at home with metronome, you can fool yourself and drop beats and all sorts of stuff like that. You, know, you, you can be a little too nice to yourself when you're sight reading and give yourself a lot of flexibility with the tempo and all sorts of things. But in a group, when you're playing chamber music, it's um, a very musical experience because you're all trying to play together and you have lots of listening skills going on. But also you just can't miss a beat and you can't stop playing. So it's just, it's such a great way to practice in such a musical way and it can be really fun too. And also I'll just, one other comment is that if you do that with uh, musicians that are more advanced than you, it'll really jumpstart your skills. You'll have to keep up and that will make you a much better sight reader. Uh, next thing, study music theory and musicianship. So music theory, uh, you know, will help you to understand the patterns that you're seeing on the page. And then you'll be able to transfer those patterns onto the guitar. So if, if you see a whole bunch of notes stacked on top of each other in thirds, and there's, you know, there's, you're in a major key and it's the tonic chord, it's probably a major chord. And knowing that means that you can look at it instead of having to pick through each note, little black dot on the page, you, you might just know that, oh, that's an, a major chord and I'll make it. So it's just a transfer from there onto the fretboard really instantaneously without having to pick, up, pick out and think about it. So music theory can really help with that. Um, or, you know, taking a look at a passage and saying that's in that key. Um, and then you know what scale fingering or what, what sharps or flats are it's going to be. So music theory really, really helps. And musicianship, when I say musicianship, I mean... Um, Things like clapping exercises, clapping out the rhythms, or singing the rhythms, or singing intervals, or uh, just all those. Um, um, when you go to like music university, you take classes on musicianship where you, you sight sing, and you clap, and you, you do all these exercises away from your instrument. And that means that when you look at something on the page, you know in your mind what it is. And then all you have to do is make sure your technique on your instrument is strong enough that you can make that transfer. Um, another thing you can do is study guitar technique and fretboard comprehension. Guitar technique will just help you play better. It'll, it'll make sight reading easier just because you'll be able to play at a higher quality level. Fretboard comprehension is a little bit different than music theory or technique because instead of just practicing scales, like just memorizing a fingering and practicing the actual scale, often with like fretboard comprehension, what you want to do is learn how the fretboard works. So how does, how do scales work on the fretboard? And, you know, there's active exercises you can do for, for learning that. Um, fretboard comprehension might include something like figuring out all your root position triad shapes of the strings. Not even reading them necessarily on music notation. Maybe just figuring out where they are or knowing that, like, that's a first inversion C major chord. Um, a triad. So... Uh, fretboard comprehension is just important for just knowing your instrument really well. I'm designing a few books on that, but you know, most method books have fretboard comprehension kind of built in. Next thing is use appropriate materials at your level. Um, I'll talk about that more next, but yeah, you want to choose materials that are a little bit, well, quite a bit easier than your solo repertoire. Uh, if you're pushing it too much, you might not be able to build the sight reading skills you wanted to build. So if I'm talking about like looking way ahead in the music and never dropping a beat and playing musically, you better have materials that are easy enough that allow you to do that. So finding materials at your level or below your level 
is, is very important. And I'll talk about that in just a second. The other thing is just consider playing more single line melodic material. Um, guitarists were kind of halfway between like string players like cello, cellists and violinists and pianists. You know, we, we do play melody and we do play accompaniment and sometimes we put it together, well, often in our solo pieces. But you know, it's, we're not, it's tough on the guitar and just from a technical standpoint. And so reading more single line material is, is, it would be really healthy for us. And it's a little bit easier to connect scale patterns to it and stuff like that. It's also just really enjoyable, especially when you're playing chamber music, you can just do single line stuff. Uh, but, you know, violinists, they read single line material the 90% of the time, and they just become very proficient at it. And I, I think we could too. And sometimes when I'm sight reading, um, especially in a chamber music rehearsal or something, I'll drop a whole bunch of the bass notes and just play whatever melody there is. You know, I, it might have a whole bunch of chords and other things in my part, but if I, if I need to play well on the spot, and I just don't know it well enough, then um, I'll just drop all the other stuff and just play a single line melody because I want it to sound good and I don't want to mess up anyone else in the group and I want it to be in time. So if my priorities are right, um, of course, I'll go back and eventually practice it so I know it all, but playing that single line material is, is just really beneficial. Okay, um, materials and books for sight reading on the classical guitar. One thing I'll say first is, um, like I said, uh, method books are really great. And one thing that students often don't do, but they they could and they should, is use an additional method book. So like, if you've studied my first two method books, and you feel like you've ingrained all my knowledge into your hands, well then go get another method book. You know, it'll start from the very beginning with uh, what notes are these? But you can use those notes to practice your sight reading. And also, it could be good um, to, to see what how another method book presents the material. You can learn a lot just by going over method books. And it's great sight reading material because as you learn more notes in the method book, uh, you'll, I'm talking about beginner method books, but you'll, um, the, the difficulty will increase and you can really work on your sight reading skills. So, that's always a material that's available to, to everyone, right? There are some sight reading books um, for the more beginner and early intermediate levels. I'd recommend like the Robert Benedict uh, Sight Reading for Classical Guitar. Those, his two books are really great. They have like hundreds of examples and they're just like four to eight bar examples, but they're in various textures. Like it's, it's as if each example is a song, but it's only a few bars long. So it's not a song, it's an exercise. But it's cool because they have dynamics and they have different textures and they're for the classical guitar. And so it's kind of neat. It's like playing hundreds of pieces, except they're all four to eight bars long. So it's just really good practice and there's so much variety in the textures that you just learn a lot. And he talks about form and he talks about dynamics. He talks about lots of things in the book. So it's just like a great sight reading book for that reason. Um, you know, other books like uh, Aaron Shearer's Scale Supplement Studies for the Guitar is Supplement 3. That book is 279 pages long of just scale patterns and then sight reading using that pattern. So he does it in every key, in every position of the guitar, just the melodic lines. Um, that is very thorough and it's pretty intense because it's such a huge book, but you can just do a little bit each day and it's so great because you'd be surprised that learning to sight read well in B major will actually make your sight reading in other keys much better. It just really increases your knowledge of key signatures and the guitar and all the positions of the guitar. At the end of the book, he blends the positions together so you have to shift and stuff. It, it's a real practical and thorough study of the instrument. It's not for everyone because 279 pages is quite long, but I usually just tell students like, just do a little bit um, each day, five minutes a day for the rest of your life, and you'll be fine. Um, or sometimes I'll cover all of the C major examples so that they learn C major over the entire fretboard. Um, that can be really helpful. Another overlooked set of materials would be jazz books, or popular music books too, but jazz books. Um, briefly, I attended jazz college, and during that time, I learned all my scales and all my chords and triads over the entire fretboard. I was like, that's all I did when I went there. I just did that, a ton of that stuff. 
And when I left that and came back to classical guitar, even though I'd been doing classical guitar through that too, but um, going over things like the sheer book was great because I, I knew my fretboard super well and knew all the patterns super well. So reading them was just a matter of like seeing like, oh, that's a jump of a sixth in that fingering. That's easy. Interval of a sixth. Um, it's like an, it's a great way to kind of, um, know your instrument so that you don't get caught up because some of us will get caught up by the instrument, some by the notation, but I kind of took care of one aspect there and then I could just focus on, on really upping my sight reading skills. So I hope you enjoyed that and I hope you start working on your sight reading every day and find some materials to do that. If you're interested, you can check out my educational series of books which has uh, various different levels. And um, my first method book for beginners is free. It's a 100-page method book, so you can just download it for free. There's not even a sign-up for it. So just go grab that, and you can start sight practicing your sight reading right away.